Uh, one of the folks uh, who also uh, has been speaking uh, on this issue is Reverend Dr. William Barber. It's Sunday, he preached at Rankin Chapel. Uh, he joins us right now on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Reverend Barber, how you doing? I'm doing well, brother. I hope you are, and thank you for everything, uh, Roland. We appreciate all that you do, and so glad to hear um, Reverend Jackson. I was back in North Carolina when I heard about his fall and immediately contacted people, and I'm just glad that he's back and, and, and that he as an elder uh, is, is working with those students, and they're welcoming that. You know, it's a, it's a powerful uh, scene of community. You know, it's it's very interesting, Reverend Barber. Uh, as I as I um, um, you look at what's happening, not just with this issue, but you look at what's happening uh, all across uh, the country here. When you look at these elections that are going on, uh, and uh, why activism still matters, why protest still matters, why let, uh, making sure your voice uh, is heard still matters, and that has a direct bearing on all of these. Uh, elections, when you are speaking to issues, that's what turns out voters. You're exactly right, uh, Roland. And when you don't speak to issues, uh, it turns off voters. You know, one of the things I talked to the students about the other day when after the sermon, I was there at my scheduled time to preach, and they requested that we come over and pray with them and talk to them. But we also, Roland, talked about how their consciousness about the wrong that's going on on the campus is also leading them to a deeper consciousness about housing in the country. You know, we have over a half million people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, we have, you know, 41% of those, by the way, are black. And uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 7.4 million people are on the brink of some form of homelessness if they just have one or two things go wrong. And people want to hear those issues. It's amazing to me, Roland, how uh, sometimes our Democratic brothers and sisters run from what's actually polling popular. You know, I watched the other morning when, 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 when Manchin McConnell opened the Senate. You know, he had the nerve to talk about a 30-year-old whose rent has gone up the last three years. He talked about a guy whose uh, um, uh, gas has gone up and how if, if they didn't pass the Build Back Better plan, he would get a better tax break and be able to pay for it. Then I listened to my to Congressman Schumer, I mean, Senator Schumer. And he probably just talked about the numbers. He didn't talk about the people. He didn't talk about the faces. You know, and the truth of the matter is affordable housing, universal pre care, health care for all, uh, uh, um, money for community college, free college, all of these things, the people want them. $15 minimum wage in a union. But you've got to put a face on it. And if you don't do that, then you get stuck and you allow somebody like Manchin to take over the debate and act as though there's this problem with the deficit, there's this overexpenditure. If you listen to Manchin talk, you would think we're spending $3.7 trillion or $1.7 trillion tomorrow and not over 10 years, uh, which is really what's going on. And in fact, we really ought to do $10 trillion, a trillion a year, and that could be handled with the tax on billionaires, and if you told people what that was actually going to do for their daily lives, you would get massive support from the community. The as we as looking waiting for these election results, as we're looking at uh, what happens tonight. Um, frankly, no matter what happens, whether Democrats win in Virginia or New Jersey, whether they lose, uh, this should be a dry run uh, for both of these parties uh, to speak uh, to poor folks, to speak to, uh, and I, cause we constantly hear this and it, it is, it is, is ad nauseum. Uh, and, and President Joe Biden does this and frankly, it's, it's idiotic. The middle class, 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 not the only people who make up this damn country. And so if that's right. the only group you keep talking to and you just keep, you never mention those who are below the middle class, they're sitting there going, well, hell, do we matter? Exactly. And we just did a study. You, you, you talked about it before. We just completed it called We're Waking the Sleeping Giant. And in that study, Roland, it said 40% of the voting population in battleground states are poor and low-income low voters. Across the country, 30%. Now, think about this. Here we are in Virginia. I've been listening just like you. Middle class, middle class, middle class. 43% of the people in Virginia are poor and low wealth. 43%, 3.5 million residents. 
they have not heard their name spoken. 51% of our children in a, 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 a low income. 44% of the women in Virginia, 1.9 million, 57% of people of color are poor and low wealth in West Virginia. In West, excuse me, in Virginia. 800,000 people uninsured in Virginia. 1.4 million workers who make under $15 in Virginia. So how in the world are you running a campaign and literally not speaking to 30 to 40 percent of the population? It makes absolutely no sense. And if you keep saying that, you're right, middle class people feel like they are they don't matter. And there's two ways people vote. One is they vote against you. The other is they just don't vote, period, period. And most of these states, most of these states, the number of people who just have stopped voting because because they feel nobody cares about them, they never hear their name, their condition, could could shift the margin of victory in any state, particularly like a Virginia, a North Carolina, West Virginia, so forth and so on. Questions uh, from my panelists. I'll start with Mustafa Santiago Ali. Of course, uh, sorry, Michael, alphas get first dibs in asking <laughs> questions of alphas. So, Mustafa, go right ahead. Reverend, Reverend Barber, thank you so much for the work that you continue to do. Uh, I'm curious, and I know that you've been, been working on this. You know, how do we get these politicians to begin to do the right thing? I know that you have pushed Manchin, Cinema, and, of course, a number of other folks who are also there on the state level to begin to move their policies forward in a way that actually resonate with everyday folks. Is there anything else additional that we should be doing? Well, I do think so, uh, brother. Thank you for that question. You know, regardless of what happens with this election, regardless of what happens with this BBB plan, that, that, is, that is a tremendous step. It's a step, but it's a transformative step. It's not the end of the journey. Uh, it should be much more. But we but we are, it's an important step. And it's important change in some of the things that are finally being addressed that we're saying we ought to invest in. I believe, if you look through history, that every there has to be a massive populist movement, a moral, what I call a moral fusion movement. And there always has to be a, a, a day, a, a, that's a declaration where people say, we're not going to be quiet anymore. And so what we're doing, we're mobilizing after war, June 18, 2022, for the most transformative generation to transform the gathering of poor and low wealth people, their allies, moral and religious and economists, for a, not a day, not a gathering in Raleigh or in Washington, D.C., just for remember, but a declaration that we are not going to be quiet, we're not going to have 40 percent of the voting population and nearly 50 percent of the, 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 the country constantly dismissed. Uh, and, and we're working toward that now, mobilizing towards it, and then we'll be organizing it afterwards to flex power. The second thing I think we have to do you know, we play too much kid gloves with Manchin and Cinema. <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to do a piece this week. In fact, we'll talk to you, DeMar Logan, about it. Why hasn't anybody just come out and said, Manchin, your policy and your blocking uh, the Build Back Better plan uh, is, in fact, a form of systemic racism and a form of systemic classism, and then showed the numbers. Every thing Manchin has blocked since February of this year has had a disparate impact on black people. When he blocked $15 in the union, he blocked 41% of black people from coming out of poverty and lower. That's racism. If he, Either he doesn't know it, which is an incompetence, and if he knows it, that's worse. If you look at these bills that are being passed and proposed, the infrastructure bill, 89% of that money goes to white men. If you look at the, the, the investment in, in people, uh, whether it's the child care, whether it's the child tax credit, whether it's the earned income tax credit, whether it's the money for affordable housing, that's where you have disparity. That's, I mean, excuse me, that's where you have the possibility of having some, some more equality. And if you look at those, in each, if he, anybody who blocks that plan is hurting black people and hurting poor white people. And it needs to be said, it's time out for us just saying, you know, voter suppression is a form of racism or uh, somebody, a cop killing somebody is unarmed as racism. They are. 
But you have to also name the systemic racism in economic and tax policies because too often people engage in it under those policies but try to act like it's not racist. And if we were to do that, we could actually do more to build bridges between poor whites and black folk because we would be able to show that the same people hurting black people are hurting poor white folk and vice versa. Uh, Teresa, your question. Yes, Reverend Barber, one, I am uh, an absolute fan of your work um, and the the continuous message that you have been putting across in order to bridge the gap for so many inequalities. Um, what can everyday people go or do, um, but more so go, I'm looking for more so like websites, social media that we can actually um, um, reach out and also engage in some of your efforts? If you would go to breachrepairs.org, www.breachrepairs.org, and sign up for the newsletters and sign up for the tweets and, and, and pull all of our studies down, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because we've tried to be more than just a bumper sticker movement and a bumper sticker, uh, uh, you know, phraseology. We actually have empirical data that informs our organizers. We have a study called The Souls of Poor Folk. Uh, uh, the state of poverty since the, the, the Poor People's Campaign. We have another study uh, uh, entitled Unleashing the Power of Poor and Low Wealth Voters. We just did one called Waking the Sleeping Giant. We've done one called Mall uh, uh, Economics is Good Economics. Uh, we did it with the Economic Policy Institute. We also have a, st- a piece there called The Third Reconstruction, uh, Ending Poverty and Low Wealth from the Bottom Up. Twelve strategic things we need to do are vetted by some of the best economists that says if we do these things, we can address systemic racism and poverty and ecological devastation, denial of health care, uh, the underfunding of our children's future and education, and it benefits the entirety of the society. These things are not um, just pipe dreams. The truth of the matter, when I, when I was in Rome, I was with two Nobel Peace Laureate uh, economists and uh, with the with Vatican. And two, three things were said that we have to say over and over again. And you go to that website, uh, you can also click there and go to the Poor People's Campaign website. But the three things were said. Number one, the, the, the claim of scarcity is a lie. The claim of scarcity is a lie. Number two, the claim that we don't know how to address the issues of poverty and low wealth which impacts 60.9% of black people. 60.9% of black people are poor and low wealth. The, the, we have the ideas. What we don't have, is, what, we, what, we, what we don't have is, is consciousness. The scarcity is in the consciousness of this country, and that's only going to be changed by mass movement. So we want people to go there, read up, and then join up so that we can continue to mobilize uh, in this country. Well, uh, I'm going to allow uh, Michael Brown to ask a question. Uh, we all feel sorry. For all, <laughs> we, still, we feel sorry for all Omegas. So, uh, Michael, go ahead uh, and ask this great alpha man a question. I'm sure Reverend Barber uh, does not feel the way you feel about Omegas. Yes, he does. Uh, <laughs> 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 I ain't that saved yet, Doc. No. I'm just messing. Go ahead, Doc. <laughs> Uh, Reverend Barber, it's uh, always a pleasure. The um, Something we were talking about earlier, the challenge of how we get um, our people to the polls when it's a non-presidential election year. We seem to always have this, this traditional dip on these off-year elections. What do you think we can do to try to combat that? Well, I'm probably going to get in a little trouble, but I'm just going to get in it. First of all, I think that all of our African-American elected officials need to run in off-year and in on-year elections like they have competition. I think too often in some of these places when people are in quote-unquote safe districts, they don't really put forth an effort, and that undermines the, the numbers that turn out at large. I think that I hope that there has been an all-out every person that could, that was elected, went to Virginia, for instance, in some way. But number three is we've got to get our people voting an agenda and not just a personality. Because if we keep staying with personality, we're going to be in trouble. 
And that's why we got to make sure that we are putting forth an agenda and organizing people. We call it, uh, we call it uh, um, uh, uh, being a, a movement where people uh, vote for, with an agenda. We call it mobilizing, organizing, registering, and educating. Call it doing more. And let me tell you, tell you an example of what I mean by that. Um, um, uh, in, in the off-year election in Kentucky, uh, there was a Republican incumbent and it was a Democrat running. We never endorsed the Democrat. But what we did was we went even into so-called Trump County, five of them, and we talked to people about the agenda and, I, and, and what needed to happen to change their lives. And said, don't so much vote for the person, vote for the agenda, vote for, push your own agenda, vote in that way. Three of those counties that have been so-called red counties turned. And the governorship changed. Uh, we never endorsed the governor. We never came out and endorsed the governor. But what we did was we promoted an agenda. Uh, in, in, in North Carolina, you know, we talk a lot about Georgia, but people forget after the Moral Monday movement in North Carolina, not only did we win against voting, but we were able to mob- we were able to bring the, the governor that was sitting, the Republican numbers down to about 39%. We were able to turn out people because we had same-day registration. So we didn't have to register people and then vote. They could go and vote the same day and register. But by pushing people around an agenda, we were the only Southern state that had that won a Democratic governor, Democratic Secretary of State, Democratic uh, Attorney General, Democratic uh, leaders of the state Supreme Court, and broke the veto-proof uh, legislature so that they can't be pass all these crazy laws because the governor has enough veto power to stop it. So we have to drive folk to the polls around agendas and not just personalities. And that's the work we've got to do. Uh, and it's got to be work that we do among black people the conscious, white people the conscious, you know, brown people the conscious. I want us to never forget, for instance, when the, the march from Selma to Montgomery was probably the most diversified march of the, of the civil rights movement. Think about that. And at the end of that march, Dr. King said something that I think we ought to analyze again and again and, and appro- appropriate. He said that the reason that we have segregation and voter suppression, he said, was the fear of the Southern aristocracy. Their great fear of the po- masses of poor Negroes cooking up with the masses of poor white people, joining around an agenda and voting in such a way that they change the economic architecture of the nation. That has always been the fear of the elite and the, and the, and the racist uh, uh, aristocracy in this nation. That's their fear now. That's, what they're, that's why they're trying to drive certain people home and make them stay home. And we cannot do this personality by personality by personality. It's got to be what energizes folk is the agenda. All right. Reverend Barber, uh, you mentioned the upcoming event that y'all are having. What's that again? Well, uh, we're going to, let me just say, we're going to be back in West Virginia on Monday. And we're going to take a group of economists, including Jeffrey Sachs, renowned economist. He came back most of and said, look, I want to go to West Virginia and tell these for how they're being used. He wants to go right at this foolishness that manager has been talking about. Uh, about he needs stuff, you know, uh, uh, what he scored and, and, and about the deficit. And so we're actually going there. And then uh, I got something I want to tell you a little later, uh, Roland, but uh, I've had about, uh, over 100 West Virginians say, you know, they're sick of this and they want to come back to D.C. So we're um, working together on that. And then on, on Thursday night, you can tune in online, the Poor People's Campaign, the Institute for Policy Study and the Economic Policy Institute. We're doing a piece called What's In It, What's Not In It, and Where Do We Go From Here? It is a full analysis of this VBB bill, disaggregated by race and geography, so that people can really understand what's in it, what's not in it, and where do we go from here. Thursday at 8 o'clock, you can go to our website and tune in. Well, it sounds like you need to have a whole bunch of people in mainstream media watch that because they've spent too much time Focus on the process and the number, and not what's actually in the plan. That's that, and you know, Roland, except for you and a few others, that's been the that's the media's fault. They, the same thing they did with Trump when they allowed him to come on and have all this airtime. 
and never checked him and built him up. It's the same thing now. They, they talk about this plan. They're not talking about who it impacts. They're not talking about what's in it. And they're not allowing this question to be asked. It's not a, what does it cost if we do it. The real question is what does it cost if we don't do it. Oh, and by the way, I'm leaving tomorrow going to uh, Brunswick, Georgia, uh, with the B- the, 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 the Mod family there and Barbara Awan and, and uh, Wednesday and Thursday because we can't let that case either just kind of slip off the off the radar screen. Um, that was a, a you know a stalking, a killing, and a hunting. Uh, and there must be serious consequences to what happened. All right, then. Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. God bless. Take care, man. Yes, sir. Thanks a bunch. All right. Hey, Dr. 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 Video in just one moment. Betty is saving big holiday shopping at Amazon. So now she's free to become Bear Hug Betty. Settle in, kids. You'll be there a while. Ooh, where are you going? Time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a black man owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Like, wow, rolling was amazing on that. Stay black, I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? 